Hey, so you're listening to Just Another Fanboy, episode number 264, Self-Publishing with Keith Cunningham. for that, but I think you'll find this a bit more interesting. Hello and welcome to another all-new episode of Just Another Fanboy. I'm your host, my name is Steven, and before we get in today, in today, I skipped a word there, didn't I? Before we get into the meat of the episode today... I just have a couple of uh, quick announcements to make. First off, we are reaching the end of May, and I have mentioned it before, but the end of May means the end of season six of Just Another Fanboy. Now, I had previously said that I was going to go away for a month. All of June, I was I was going to go on a, a, a little vacation, and therefore there would be no episodes of Just Another Fanboy released during the month of June. That is on the fast track to changing. I don't want to talk about it just yet. I will make it an official announcement next Tuesday, which will be the technically the the final episode of the season, uh, the episode in which I go on vacation. That's still happening. I'll tell you this. I am not going to be recording any new episodes in June. However, you should still get two episodes a week in June. And I, I'm not going to tell you how. That's that's You're going to need to wait until next week to find out how that's going to happen. The next thing I wanted to talk about is, you know, I've mentioned before that I uh, was a musician in a previous life. Well, recently, uh, two of the old bands that I used to be in back in the 90s, we have started moving all of our recorded material into the music streaming service atmosphere. And so uh, the band Larry, we did three different demos for a total of nine songs. Well, I I, I got a hold of the other three guys that were in the band with me at the time. And I said, hey, do you guys mind if I put these songs up on all the streaming services? And and, uh, they said, nah, that's that's fine. Go ahead and do that. And so I actually collected them all into into one album. It's called All Inclusive. I, I put a a uh, an album cover together an album cover but you put an album cover together i put an oh good lord i put an album cover together and uh you can now get that over on on apple music and youtube music and amazon music and spotify i think one of those music services i i can't remember if it's amazon or if it's spotify they have lumped us in with every other artist out there that has ever used the name larry and so if you go into the the artist's page uh i think it's amazon because i i actually was able to go in and join the the amazon's artists account and claim the the name larry as 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 mine own and so i'm I'm trying to clean all that up. I'm, I I had to submit a bunch of tickets to remove every other album and single that is listed under that particular artist's account, the Larry account. So eventually all that stuff is going to go away. But for now, if, if you if you look up Larry in, I, I'm pretty sure it's Amazon Music, um, you're going to see all inclusive. And then you're going to see like 40 other albums from various different artists who are also called Larry or have Larry in their name. It's, it's very strange. Anyway, I'll have links in the show notes and uh, to, to commemorate the launching of these songs going up in the streaming services. Um, I also created a video for one of our songs for, from Larry called Philadelphia. And, and it's, uh, I spent a lot of time on it. I'm very, very quite proud of it. Um, and, uh, I mean, I what I, I 
I use the the service Canva. If you've ever used that service, they have uh, like co Creative Commons video clips, and that's all I did. So there's like a lot of footage of uh, musicians playing in certain areas of the video. You can't see their faces. It's just like close ups of people playing guitar or drums and whatnot. And that's that's not us at all. I, I put that in the in the notes of the YouTube video that there is no actual footage of the band because you know we 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 toured quite a bit we played over 200 shows back between 93 and 96 uh and we got some of it on video but they're all on videotape and i have yet to be able to transfer that over to digital and even if i did it's all just a bunch of you know somebody setting up a video camera on a tripod and hit and record and so it's just a static shot of a stage from far enough back that you can't really make out uh really who it is by that point anyway again links will be in the show notes the the other band i was in trinity x that in that stuff's going up as well but i uh started uploading that stuff uh a few days after larry so they're not it's not all up there yet but anyway just wanted to make that information known now as far as the main subject at hand here i'm trying not to stretch this out too long because I got together over the weekend uh, over Skype, and I talked to uh, uh, a fella by the name of Keith Cunningham. We we kind of go back a ways. We've known each other online for I don't know ten or fifteen years. I've I've known him since the 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 original just another fanboy days. He's one of those fellas I met over on the uh, Comic Geek Speak forums, um, and have been tangentially involved in his, with him uh in creative ventures here and there um just kind of brushing up against each other creatively every now and again but um he's written a book Secret Highways and Other Stories and uh he went the self-publishing route just like I did and he was tweeting out the other day when after it released you know it's like how do you for for those of you who've done this how do you market your book without coming across as, you know, an annoying salesperson. And my answer was, yeah, you don't. It's 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 not easy there. I, I have yet to learn that trick, which is why I don't sell all that many books. But I asked him if he wanted to come on the show and talk about his book. And he said, yeah, let's do that. And so sat down over Skype and uh, we talked for about an hour and a half. Actually, we talked for about two hours. I got it narrowed down to about an hour and a half in the recording. So this is going to be a long episode, folks. Buckle in. I will. Uh, I'll. I'll come in there at the end afterwards and and wrap up the show. But uh, here is my conversation with Keith Cunningham. You have some fun stuff behind you. I just. I just have to say. Yeah. You've got some fun stuff. I'm. Ooh. Is that a. Is. Is that an original man? Is that a trade of the Man of Steel mini? That is actually a. Uh, Pete, just a uh, artwork of the cover. Oh, okay. Is that what it's all those on, are up there? Yeah, they're like okay. wooden plaques. Oh, very nice. Very nice. That's some cool stuff. I don't recognize the Hulk cover. I don't know what that's from. Um, that a, what issue is I don't know. Uh, it's issue 105, July of some year. It was approved by the Comics Code Authority, and it was 12 right. cents. Well, I'm glad it was approved because I wouldn't have read it. Won't read those non-approved. Yeah comics and then is the iron giant wearing a loincloth am i seeing that correctly no that is oh. the uh the wing of destroyer okay <laughs> it looks like he's wearing it's like you want it's he, he's, feeling iron giant. he's feeling modest it's like yeah. nowhere pants must have superman have loincloth <laughs> well superman does wear the trunks so yeah he 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 he's really doubling down on the underwear because he's yeah. like I I got him on the inside and the outside just want to make sure. Well, you know if you're flying around, it gets cold up there. You want a little an extra layer. Yeah, a lot of Funko Pops. I love yes. I love the Funko Pops. There's so many that I would love to have. Or is as that, I call is, it my retirement fund. Is that David Tennant Doctor Who with the sunglasses between the turtles and the the Man of Steel? Boards. No, that um, all of that is uh, Stranger Things ones. So that's oh, okay. The kid with the oh, nail. okay. I recognize it now with the big sunglasses. I know who that is now. All right, that's the 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 older boy. Yeah, the cool one. <laughs> I'm only I, yep. I I I don't know that I've gotten past season. I don't. I think I watched 
I don't think I've started season three yet. I don't know what I'm waiting for. Yeah, it's like I think the season four starts in like a week. Yeah, I hear the season finale or the the series finale is going to be like two hours long. I thought they were making a season five though. I I don't know. I feel like I read that season four is going to be the last one, mm. or maybe what I'm what I've been reading is about season five. I don't I don't know. Maybe. I don't pay a lot of attention. I don't know stuff. nothing. Yeah, you gonna. I just have this regular home decor behind me. I you have, have like a, a grown up house. Well, I just don't have any, you know, it's like A, I've I've run out of money to do collectibles, and B, even if I had the money, I don't have room. I have room to put collectibles. I don't I don't have obviously I don't have my own room for this because I wouldn't otherwise I wouldn't be out here in the middle of the dining room doing my podcasting. But uh yeah. And I'm okay with that. You're gonna you you're still a young man. Keith, you're going to you're going to reach <laughs> okay. an age where you're just like, uh, yeah, I don't I don't I don't have I don't have time for all that brick a brack. I don't have time for that nonsense. Oh, well, it man. helps not to have, you know, a family to have to spend money on. So, well, that's true. I just I imagine if I didn't have that, just I, I would probably be covered in all kinds of geekery all over the place and then couldn't get a woman in here. <laughs> <laughs> See? It's a self-fulfilling it's, cycle. It's, and there's a trade-off. There's a trade-off. Yeah, she loves me despite the geekery. I do have an attic full of comic books that uh, are rather unsorted, and I just and never will be. Yeah, they never will be. Every time I go up and I, I, I'm going to go up there and sort these comics, and I stand there and look at them and go, I'm going to go watch TV because <laughs> there's a lot it's of like they they're fine. Yeah, they're they're good. They're fine. They're OK. All right. Um, well, let's talk about your book. And then I okay. think we'll just we'll just kind of go from there because you uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking at your your website, which you uh, admitted earlier needs a bit of an update. But if I go to your about page, this is phantom spaceman studios dot com. I will have that link in the show notes. It says here on your about page that you are a writer, a cartoonist and an animator. Um, but we're going to, I think, focus more on the the, the writer part today, uh, even though one of the things that you do that I, I enjoy uh, a couple times a week is the old stale popcorn uh, web comic. That is that's all you. Right. I mean, you're you're writing it. You're drawing it. It's it's you. Yep. Uh, yeah. Uh, the it's Ryan King and I came up with the concept a while back and we did like an earlier incarnation of it. Mm-hmm. But I was the one who relaunched it, and he's like, "By all means, go for it." And for my sins, I have. Yeah, yeah. So everything that you've been putting up there for stale popcorn lately—that's that's all brand new stuff, correct? Um, some of it has been remade of they're like remakes of older strips, ones that still apply. Okay. That aren't like dated, but yeah, it's all it's all new art and stuff. And it's about a uh, movie theater. Yep. The the employees, it's like, uh, you know, if, if we're going to use a, a marketing technique where you, you always have to elevate or pitch everything. And it's always best to, from what I hear, to use like a, it's speed meets die hard. You know, it's die it hard on a exactly bus. That's like what that's speed, what speed meets yeah. die hard. So it's so uh, a stale popcorn would be like clerks meets, I don't know, clerks in a movie theater. Right. Yeah. There you are. Yeah. There you go. Clerks yeah, I there. worked as a film projectionist for five years. So yeah, that must have been fun. It had its moments. There were definitely some interesting things, and then the um, switch over to digital projection kind of made that job obsolete. Yeah, yeah, I get that. The only comparison I can make it to is when I <laughs> I was working in a uh, Walgreens photo lab. And they switched from processing uh, film to just only doing digital photos. And it's like print, I went from print. feeling like I had a skill to then just pushing buttons. That's, mm-hmm. you know, so. All right. That's uh yeah. Stale so popcorn. I've, I've kind of like in my head, I've included the, the, the idea that the theater and stale popcorn has like they have one old projector. Yeah. That they run older movies on for special yep. Yeah, because there's going to be certain movies from back in the day that they don't that that's your only choice. You yeah. gotta you gotta do the real. And is it is it like what we saw in um, Fight Club, where there's a little mark in the movie so the projectionist knows to switch out the reels? Is that well, the, 
the the thing about that was that used to be the the way it was when they were using the carbon arc projectors. So you had like two projectors side by side. Mm-hmm. Uh, when they moved to the xenon bulb projectors, they would actually assemble the whole film onto one big reel out of the smaller reels. So those marks are where the reel begins and ends. Okay. But um, the projection has basically just had to assemble all of that, and then it would be built for the run as when it was in there, and then it'd tear it down for when they shipped it back. Sorry, I had a minor freak out there. A spider literally just <laughs> it came down from the You ceiling. missed your chance to become a superhero. I did. I did. But with my luck, it, it I would just die. <laughs> so... Yeah, that was uh that was some film uh geekery knowledge for everybody out there. Xenon bulb. Did I get that right? Yep. Uh, it's a basic it's yeah, it's a z- xenon the gas inside a compressed bulb. That don't touch it with your bare hand because when the skin oil heats up when the bulb goes off, it'll go off like a hand grenade and everyone in the world will die. That's how the zombie apocalypse starts. Yes. That's it says that on the side. No, the, but you can probably lose a few fingers. Yeah, and that would suck. Working with old projectionists are like, don't ever touch the, you know, like an old shop teacher without with missing fingers and stuff. This one was a bandsaw. This one was the diabetes. <laughs> nice. So what made you what made you decide to because uh, you just looking at your 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 Web page? You are obviously uh, you got kind of your hands in a bunch of different creative uh, ventures, different areas, animation, writing, my fingers and more comics. pies than a leper at a bake sale. All right. A leper. Huh? What is OK? <laughs> Took me a second. I'm a little slow. Took me a second. Why? Why would a leper be OK? No, I get it now. See? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, my my audience knows that I'm not a quick man, that I'm not a smart man. But I know that you have dabbled in the writing of the short stories. And I guess this this book and I I obviously have to pull it up because I can't remember the title right off the top of my head. Secret Highways and Other Stories uh, would be a culmination of uh, years of writing short stories. Would that be correct? Am I am I making the wrong guess? Yeah, before I actually started, like, the cartooning, long before that, I was doing prose. Yeah. And I kind of fell out of it a little bit just because cartooning takes up so much time. Yeah. And there's almost a – when it comes to something like a like a webcomic, there's more of, a, uh, of an instant audience gratification with a right. webcomic than, than prose. Because, you know, unless you're writing, like, Unless it's mine, stories, which does not have an audience. Well. Yes. I think I think I think I think a lot of us are in that boat. You know, I, I we may spend some time here with with uh, with Stephen being bitter about the whole creative world out there because uh, you know I've I, I've I've had my fingers in a lot of pies as well and uh, have have tasted the the bitter taste of failure many times over. He's pouring so, scotch. Yeah, and I may you may find me complaining about the uh, self publishing community as well when it comes to prose, which uh, I have a love hate relationship with, and we, we may get into that, we may not, but well, I, I know we're going to talk about self publishing because Are you that's, break that's my spirit. Obviously, no, no, not at all, no, <laughs> not at all. I, I, we'll, we'll we'll talk about it. I don't want to launch into it just yet, but so this is uh, eighteen short stories that you've put together in one collection and then you have self-published it. It's available on Amazon, uh, both, uh, the, the Kindle. So you got an ebook and you got the paperback, which, Mm -hmm. uh, you can get through Amazon. Can you get it? Do you, do you have it out there in other areas, other places? I will have it. Um, the first place it'll debut live, so to speak, will be at heroes con in June. Because I have an artist alley table there, so that's one of the things will be. And I'm looking at the Amazon page. It looks like a couple, maybe stores have bought yeah. one or two copies. Yeah, because there's some. Yeah. There's one used from. Yeah. So. Yeah, that I had the same experience. You also find if uh, you Google your name, sometimes you'll find uh, your book is already being pirated. <laughs> <laughs> and it's out there Fantastic. You know, for free of places. Yeah. It's like, <clears throat> I found that with my books. And my first thought was, why would you, wa- I've sold maybe three copies. 
what what's the point of pirating? Is is the right. reason I've sold three copies is because everybody's getting the pirated copy? Probably not. But the the, the pirates do what they're gonna do. They're they gonna jump all they, over they, stuff. I there are some that seem to believe that it is a noble cause. Yeah. So when you decided to self publish this book, did you um did you do any kind of did you go out there and because when I first decided to self-publish my first book, I, of course, didn't. I tend to to jump into things, but I ended up spending probably a year listening to self-publishing podcasts and reading all the all the the advice and going to the forums and and kind of immersing myself in that self-publishing community. Did you do any of that? A bit. Uh, fortunately, people like you had done all that legwork for me. Nice. Already. So I was able to lean on a few people who, who have self-published before, yeah. specifically through the Amazon Kindle uh, Direct Publishing, which made it super easy. Yes. Yeah, because, you know, self-publishing used to be a dirty word. If if somebody said yeah. I've self published a book, people would be like, oh okay, and because that meant that you literally hooked up with a, a a printer and just had a thousand copies of your book printed up, and then you had to go out and try to sell it yourself. But because of Amazon and the Kindle, and and they uh, open it, you know, they've opened that up to let people upload their yeah. books and sell them. That so it's that changed self publishing. And I, I think to me it was a bit less of a scarlet letter after having come through like comics and stuff because independent publishing had been right. such a thing for so much longer. Right. That you just – it was less of a brand of uh, – you couldn't go through a real publisher yeah. so much as I just want to play by my own rules and I'm impatient. I had that very same experience. Uh, when I started really digging into the self-publishing community, because there aren't that many of them who, you know, a lot of a lot of those folks out there, a lot of those that especially the the bigger names that make a lot of money on it, that that that's their career. They self-publish their own books and they they live on that income. They this this is the only thing they know. They they you know, guys like you and me, we're we're used to growing up in a community where. Yeah, if you wanted to do a comic book, you could do it yourself, and it was a, you would self-publish it, and it would be independent, and it would be, uh, you know, kind it of was a, accepted. Yeah. yeah, it was like a garage band type of thing. It was, it was in in many cases, it was the the cooler way to go, right? It was like you are almost cooler, well, especially because for so long, it's changed now. But you had very specific companies that were publishing that had their universes. Yep. And it's like, well, if you want to do something of your own, you truly have to do it on your own. Yeah. And as a reader, if you wanted to, if you were tired of superheroes, for example, and you wanted to check out other stuff, uh, you know, at one time, really, your only option was to look at those indie creators. Hmm. And it's because of stuff like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and then every, you know, stuff that came out after that, that made indie publishing cool. And then yet you have the prose side of it, the novels, and it's like at that time it was still, you know, you were looked down upon for, for self well, it's but. Probably the same kind of dichotomy that to a degree prose looks down ac ac against comics in general, yeah. no matter how legitimate, yeah. quote unquote, or illegitimate they are. So it's – there's always going to be somebody who's going to go, yeah, but it's not real. Right. Yeah, that's what I say to them. So from my experience, you know, before I self-published, uh, you know, I, I spent all this time listening to the podcast and talking to the people and going to the various places. And and, uh, you know, the whole reason I went self-publishing is just so I, I I could do it all myself. I didn't have to worry about, you know, good Lord typing up a query letter that, that then went to an agent. And then so, so then first sat you had on a to, pile for two yeah, years. It's like, yeah. It's, it, yeah. So self-publishing appealed to me because I had this book and I wanted to get it out there. And so I would listen to all this advice and there was a lot of advice that I would hear that I just ended up just super ignoring. Did you find that yourself? Did What was the advice that you got that you just ignored and said, nah, I'm just going to do it anyway? Um, Nothing real specific because I think 
in a lot of ways, I just kind of like came into it at the perfect time. All the tools were there. Yep. And I was just like, okay, drag and drop, drag and drop. But um, mostly, I think just in general, self-publishing in general was the the rule I ignored. Yeah. And I, I found that with self-publishing, it's kind of like uh, the the kind of like podcasting. There's two different types of self-publishers out there. There's the the big guys who, again, they're making a career out of it. And so they have their own certain uh, rules and their certain sets of advice that they will give the beginner that as a right, beginner, you it's can't always for them. Right. And and a lot of it is, you know, you you never put out a book unless you hire an editor and have your book professionally edited and never put out a book unless you hire a professional cover designer to do your cover. And I heard those two bits of advice and I was like, I, I, no, I'm going to do it anyway because I can't afford a those, freaking I, editor and I can't afford a cover artist. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I, I, I've, I have um, another writer who self publishes things, who self published a book that I did some artwork for uh, called Eight Gunshots, Luke yeah. Foster. Yeah. We kind of basically edit each other. We'll write something okay. and be like, send it off to the other one and he'll send something to me. So that kind of is a, good, a nice back and forth. And as far as the cover, yeah, I completely ignored that. It helps to know artists. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, what what's the difference between a, a cartoonist and a professional cover artist or it's, you know, labels? Exactly. And because my it, here are my thoughts behind it. The, the whole reason you go the self-publishing route is because, um, again, you want to do it yourself. You don't want people standing in your way and saying, uh, nah, I'm not going to allow this to happen because – uh, I, we don't feel like publishing your book this month, you know, and, mm. and a lot of these self publishers out there, they, they talk about the gatekeepers. These are the, 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 the literary, literary agents or the people that work for the, the publishing companies. And they're the ones that, you know, decide what gets published. And as a self publisher, you don't have to worry about the gatekeepers. And yet at the same time, if you listen to a lot of their advice, it's like they kind of set up their own gatekeeping policies, which is don't self-publish a book unless you have the kind of money that it takes to have your book edited and and formatted and, uh, you know, the the professional cover artist and, and all that crap. And it's like, that's 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 all well and good. But if I wait to, to come up with that kind of money, I never would have self-published anything. Now, I say that at the same time as I can tell you that that I really haven't sold a lot of books, but I'm not really a very good marketer at the same time. So that is my problem. I think I feel very I don't like being like, hey, you know, you yep. do this every time constantly barraging people with it. It's a, which it's is a, a terrible salesman strategy. Well, it's a fine line that you got to walk because. You you need to be able to market your stuff, but at the same time, you don't want to come across as a salesperson because that will put a lot of people off. Mm -hmm. And you don't you know, want to look desperate or right. even worse, bullying. Exactly. And a lot of advice that's out there is, of course, you know, find, you know, what's what's the subject of your book? Is it, you know, are, are you doing sci-fi? Are you doing fantasy? Are you doing a uh, young adult? Blah, 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 blah narrow down on that and then just start going in and participating over on uh, reddits that, that deal with the same subject. And, you know, basically immerse yourself into all these different communities, spend months and years being, uh, you know, someone that they, that, that everybody likes and talks to. And then you, you start, you basically create an audience that way. And then you can start, Oh, by the way, did you know that I have a book? <laughs> It's and nice that's if hard you have too. The time. Right. It's yeah, the marketing I work a nine to five though. It's like there's pros and cons if you go self-publishing or you try to go through an actual publisher. And self-publishing means, of course, that you are responsible for selling that book and marketing that book and getting it out there in front of faces. Now, you said you're going to a con and that's going to be the debut. That I think is a great first step. That's something I've never done and I've never been able to. So there you go right there. 
definitely it's worth it to go just to experience i think yeah even if you you have to tamper your expectations you go in thinking that oh, i'm gonna this is gonna be my fortune making moment no it's not no yeah <laughs> you're yeah. probably gonna lose money yep I think anybody, the, the first advice anybody will give you is, is, is if you are getting into writing to uh, be a millionaire, don't get into writing because that's not where it's at. Sure, it's worked for some, but it's like, think about all, it's, 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 it's like anything. There are so many writers out there competing, uh, just like there are so many actors out there competing for the same jobs. So many bands out there can be competing for those record deals and for those fans. And, and uh, they always say the cream rises to the top, but you know, you just have to, you ultimately in the end, it all comes down to um, what you're willing to put into it and how much, you know, how long you're willing to stick to it. And I, I do, yeah. I do agree that the, the cream rises to the top. And I think, um, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. Also, you have to make your own definition of what you deem success to be. Exactly. Are you, are you still enjoying this? Yep. That should be the main criteria. I think. I agree. I agree. And, uh, you know, I would get with, I remember getting into an argument with somebody on a, on a, I think it was, it was a message board or the comment section of a, of a podcast, self-publishing podcast, because the, somebody was, it's, it's it, back to that whole, you have to have, you have to hire a professional editor and you have to have a professional cover. And, and I said, yeah, I'm not doing either of those things. I can't afford it. And they came back with, well, then you are disrespecting every single one of your readers and you're disrespecting all of us as authors. And I said, I said, look, basically what you're telling me here is self-publishing is a way to, you know, it's self-publishing's the rebellion, right? They're the, the the rebels against the empire. And we're doing this because we don't want the gatekeepers telling us that we can't. But now you're telling me that sure that you can. that's the yeah. deal, but it's only the deal if you have a lot of money. And right. And uh, whereas yeah. you're more more rather than like a overly produced punk rock band, you're an actual like garage right. band with a hand drawn album cover. And yeah. And it's and, and my thought was that works half the time. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not I'm not a uh, I don't know if you've heard the term yet as you are doing your when you're out there investigating the self-publishing world. But I, if, have you heard the tour, the, the term? authorpreneur oh god no <laughs> i wish a, i never had that's, that's terrible. a big one and it's it's these are the these are the the, the self-published authors that again they make decent money they uh are able to do nothing but write and they live off of what they make writing but then they also because one of the advantages of self-publishing is you can release books as fast as you can write them, basically. And, this is true. you know, if you can get them written and edited and cover art and all that stuff done, you could literally put out four or five books a year and, you know, novels. Whereas look at Stephen King. How often does he put a book out anymore? You know, of course, he doesn't have to. But, no. you know, a lot of those, uh, you know, authors that go that, that are with uh, big publishers, they even when they sign a, you know, they sign a deal and it's like, all right, we got to you know, do three books and we'll put them out over the next six years, basically, you know, and it's and uh, but if you're prolific and you got the time, more power to you and the heart. Yeah. Yeah. I was getting back to the author <laughs> I, I, I just thought that the reason to get into writing is because you didn't want to be a business person. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's but that's again, you also have to. Yeah, to that's part of the trade off, right? You have to be your own, your number one, mo yeah. your own advocate yeah. and your own salesman. But I wouldn't want to do it in a, such a way that the business of it gets in the way of the real business of it. Right. And that's kind of a decision I ended up having to make for myself. It's like, yeah, I can't I'm I'm not going to I'm not going to spend all the money to do the 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 stuff that I'm quote unquote supposed to do. Uh but that's okay because of course then everybody would fire back, well then your book's going to fail, you're not going to make a living being a writer and it's like, well that's I mean in the end that's not really 
what I'm going for here. I just, I wanted to write some stuff and, and, and get it out there and share it with people. Mm-hmm. And uh, sure, if people like it and I make some money off of it, great. Uh, but I don't have time to do all the freaking marketing and all that crap that, that, that comes with it. I just don't, I got a family with, with three freaking kids. And I, well, at the time it's been a while since I put out my last book, but I had two jobs. Uh, heck I wrote my, my first book, uh, while I was, um, working in the photo lab at Walgreens, <laughs> I had a notebook. And that's why and, he doesn't have that job. <laughs> that's why I got fired. No, no, I would, uh, cause there was a lot of time as, as photos were printing and I could just, hmm lean against the big giant printer and, 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 and write stuff in my notebook. But speaking of which, when do you, I, I, I find it very interesting. When do you find yourself the most uh, creative uh, when, and then when do you find yourself the most productive like during the day and do those two times ever meet middle of the night? Really? That's when my brain turns on. Yeah. which is great because I have to keep banker's hours for yeah. work. And so right. it's really messing me up. But yeah. so I, yeah. I've gotten to the point where I, I have to force myself that, you know, I get home and just make myself work yeah. again. Yep. Yeah. Which, which can be part of the, uh, you know, it's like you don't want to make yourself work, but at the same time, let me, let me ask you this. Do you, do you ever feel this? You're, you're, you're writing your story and you're kind of mm, struggling with a certain part. It's like, I don't, how am I going to, how am I, how am I going to get out of there? I know that I want to get there. Here's where I'm at right now. I know I want to get over there. I can't quite figure out how to get over there. And then suddenly, you know, it might take you three or four days, but suddenly that idea pops into your head and everything mm-hmm. about that story comes together. Isn't that like the, one of the single most greatest feelings in the world? Oh, absolutely. Where it's just like, you know, you know, point A, you know, point C, it's this point B and the transition all the way through. You're like, ah, um, er, uh, and then you're probably laying in bed at three in the morning and you're like that. <laughs> yeah. And then it's just like, oh, I wish I could feel like this all the time. Mm-hmm. And that's I think that's why most people create is that is that freaking feeling right there. You know, that 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 stuff there in the middle. That's what Jim Butcher calls the big swampy middle. Mm-hmm. He's, you know, I, I read a whole article on writing from him and he's like, for, for a lot of authors, you, you, you come up with the, with the beginning and you, you come up with the ending. Those are the easy bits. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, you've got what the, you want to say, it's yeah. the figuring out the, how to get there. Yeah. It's the really hard part. Exactly. It's like, I got the, I got the opening written. I've got the ending written. It's a super interesting idea. That's going to get from here to here. Now, what do I just put all, what do I, what about all that stuff in the middle to, to mm-hmm. then get from, yeah, from point A to point C it's, that's the hardest part. But, um, do you, let me, let me ask you this is, uh, do you, uh, when you're, when you're writing, have you heard the term pantser writing by the seat of your pants? There's, okay. there's folks who, who, who outline everything and don't start writing word one until every single bit of their story is outlined. There's folks who just sit down and start writing and the story uh, ends up where it ends up. And then there's kind of the people who do a little bit of both. Where kind of where do you fall? I tend to think of the end first. Yeah. Because I, 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 I know what it helps me to know where I want to end. Mm-hmm. Then I, I do the beginning and then the middle. And I like to kind of leave myself a lot of freedom in the middle, too. Yeah. Which is, I know, not a real interesting answer but no it's a it's a it's a good answer because i i do find it fascinating everybody is 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 a little bit different stephen king is a is a pantser as they call him and uh Mm. he i remember reading something you know a long before i really started writing where he would say you know i i have no idea where i'm going i just start the book i have an idea and i start writing and i have no idea where it's going and until it gets there and i used to think that's bull crap you know where you're going. You can't write the way you, and then, but then once I started writing, it's like, I, I get that now because I'm kind of in the middle as well. I started out as a complete pantser. I would just, I, I would have like the, the first book I wrote, uh, the adventures of Norman, Oklahoma literally started from a line. I just had a line. That's how, that's how the, the whole thing opened up. And then I just went, 
All right, where do I go from here? I've done that too, where it's like you get like a really good opening line. And you're like, how do yeah. I structure a story around this? Yep. I've yep. done that from titles even. Yeah, yeah. It, it's like yeah. this is such a there, – there's a story around this title. I know it. I just got to find it. Yeah, exactly. And uh, But then when I wrote – because the last thing I, I put out was a, a collection of uh, four novellas. And one of the the stories was the the last thing I've the last thing I've written and completed. I good Lord, I have a, a, a folder full of stories that I've started that have gone nowhere. But I think everyone has that. Yeah, I that one I actually I started it. I got you know a few lines in, and then I sat down and I didn't necessarily outline, but I wrote one paragraph for each chapter said, this is what's going to happen in this chapter. This is what they're going to do in this chapter. And so once I got that done, then I sat down and wrote and I'm like, holy crap, writing the the story now is super easy because I know where I'm going. I know exactly what's going to happen in each chapter. You know, yeah, it's like, it's like, you just have a kind of a, a loose idea of this is going to happen. Then this is going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. I just need to kind of hit these points. Yeah. But like I said, that first book, that Norman, Oklahoma book, just I literally just started. Actually, that that wasn't the first book I published, uh, but it was the first thing I started writing there. There that whole that feeling that you get when a story comes together, that really it happens quite often when you're just writing by the seat of your pants. The yeah. problem with that is there's a lot of. uh I, I would have because I've always felt more creative and more productive first thing in the morning. I'd wake mm. up, I'd have my coffee and I would sit down. I, I I would I used to get up an hour before I had to normally get up for work and then I would spend an hour writing. And I would have mornings where I would just freaking type away and I'm just just getting it all out there. And then I have mornings where I'd, I'd go like 10 minutes of writing and then I just go, OK, I don't know where to go from here. And then I'd spend the rest of the hour just sitting there thinking or, t- or writing a little and going, no, that's not going to work. And I delete that. And I write, no, that's not going to work. And I delete that. So, but that is writing though. It is. Yeah. Yeah. It is. And no, uh, knowing, knowing if something's not working is as yep. important as knowing when something is working. Yep. And I, I do think knowing where you're going is very important, but also don't be so beholden to it that you, aren't willing to let yourself be surprised by the things you come yeah. up with in the process. Yep. Cause sometimes you'll be like, Hey, this is interesting. Yeah. Kind of go off on, like you said, a tangent. And I didn't expect that I would go this way, but I'm really liking it. Yeah. And then you might find that uh, a little bit later, it's like, wait a minute, that tangent I went on would totally, if we arc back on it, six or seven chapters later, holy crap, that makes the book. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. I figured or out. Or in a short twist. story, it's like, you like, you realize, well, wait, this is actually, if I have this tangent, this is actually two short stories. Yeah, yep. <laughs> it's like, yep. You know, or, you know, or these two short stories, I'm looking at them and then it's like, no, these are actually one. I just need to, I had yep. one idea that I was trying to do too much with, or it's, it needs to be a very malleable process. Yeah. And you, you have to know and be able to accept when something is not working and that it's OK to just throw it all away, you know, mm-hmm. and yet I, no, still kind of hold on to like it. You burn it. You just, you know, yeah. you put it you on just, the shelf. Exactly. In case you need to come back to it and go, all right, I can I can do something else with this, you know, because you never know when that moment where you're like, I got it is going to happen. And it's yep. like. Six years later, I know what I need to do with this. Exactly. Yeah. And that, again, that's a pretty good darn feeling. Mm-hmm. Pretty good. So let tell us a little bit about, t- tell us about the book, because I do have it. I got the, I got it on my Kindle and I will admit I'm not done with it. I've started, I'm, I'm, a, um, I don't have a lot of time, but I'm, I'm partway into the first story at this point, okay. but it's 18 short stories. Um, I'll tell you what, let me just real quick, let me read the official Amazon description and then you can really expound official. on that if you want. To. Okay. Um, and, and when I say official, this is what you wrote the description because that's what we do. Which is as official as it's going to get. That's right. This is I'm often told uh, or was often told uh, when I was writing the the hardest 
And probably one Absolutely. of the most important parts of writing your book is writing this description. Writing the stories is easy. Yeah. Trying to sum it up, impossible. Uh, exactly. Because you want to, it's like you want to, you want to give so much in that description without giving anything away, but enough that people, mm-hmm. uh, it's really hard. It's hard. All right. So it says on a forgotten roadway in Oklahoma, two brothers find out they're on a collision course with terror. A husband finds a magic portal in his backyard. A science fiction hero steps off the screen and into the life of a young boy. On Route 66, two men, each traumatized by World War II, cross paths in one very strange motel room. A lonely town in the frozen Alaskan wilderness is terrorized by a creature out of Inuit legend. In the ruins of a future America, a crossroads demon makes a new best friend, the lone survivor of the Roswell crash, faces off against an old foe. Secret Highways contains 18 stories of the weird and fantastic inspired by the American experience. Now, I'll tell you, I this is a really good description. Um, there's a lot of this that really appeals to me. Uh, the the science fiction hero steps off to steps off to the screen steps off the screen and into the life of a young boy. I find that very intriguing. Um, the the Alaskan wilderness with the Inuit legend that there's a lot of this just in this description. I'd be like, okay, I got to check this out because a lot of this sounds really interesting. So expound on that. Tell me, tell you know, sell us sell us your book. Come on, man, market. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> no pressure. Well, the first story in the collection is the one titled Secret Highways, and it sort and it stands on its own, but it also kind of sets up the concept of the book that there is America has a lot of weird things to it, and there are stories that are unusual, and not all of them are maybe true, and but some of them are legends, and some of them are warnings. So the idea was a few of the stories in the book could potentially be seen as taking place in the same kind of world. Well, obviously, some of them do not. Uh, but you could maybe say that it's like being told from a point of view of maybe people around a campfire sharing stories about about what could be, what is, what some people think. Yeah. My, my main, um, I guess, in point of inspiration when it comes to writing it would be things like Ray Bradbury or especially like the Twilight Zone. Mm-hmm. So each of the stories has that kind of uh, Twilight Zone vibe, I hope. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I nailed. But um, I wanted in this collection each of the stories to either reflect a place in America, an aspect of America, be it good or bad. So the ones that are set in like vaguely future things will like reflect things potentially where we could wind up if we don't do things right or because there's there's one story in there um released for us barabbas which is like the idea of reality tv taken to like the most extreme yeah example Fun. and how insane and dystopian that could be whereas the idea of the science fiction hero stepping off the screen and coming into a young boy's life. It's an homage to the old movie serials like Flash Gordon of back in the day. But it also is reflective of the boy's emotional state. Yeah. And there's a lot of stuff like I thought about like trying to touch on in like American history that I'd have liked to have hit like bullet points of well this is a key american event or place or experience and it just didn't for one reason or another i couldn't find the angle on it yeah so maybe there's room for a second one at some point but uh hopefully hopefully it's honest yeah yeah as honest as a story uh, as honest as a book where you know space aliens and monsters can be well, what kind of what kind of I mean, what kind of reactions are you getting currently from uh, anybody that, you know, that may have have read it? You know, like uh, you said, you had your friend Luke who does uh, some editing and, and stuff like that for you. And I'm assuming you have other folks in your life that may have read some of these. Stories. Well, no, but well, nobody's ever going to say to your face, this is terrible. Right, right. But, but um, 
I, I'm really what I'm waiting for is to see what the completely blind reaction, yeah. which I've, hasn't really happened yet. Yeah, start looking for uh, reviews to on Amazon, for example. Yep, yep. Reviews on Amazon are not easy to get. Yeah, you need them if they're very important for the the sale of the book, but they're they're not easy to get, unfortunately. The easy ones to get, and you know what? Here's the thing. Here's the way I look at it because people are more than likely to leave a review on something they didn't like. And so yes. if if you're if if your book's not getting any review, reviews but you're getting sales, then my yeah, it's like okay, well maybe people actually like it then because uh everybody loves to talk about what they hate. Everybody loves I just spent money on something and this is why I didn't like it, but just trying to get people to tell other people, you know, in a in a in a setting like that that they liked something is not always easy. And I'm I'm not sure why that is. Right. And I guess that is the advantage of the Reddit type model where you can just upvote something. Yep. Yep. So now that you have gone through this, you, you know, you compiled your 18 stories, you formatted them, you converted into an ebook, you converted into a paperback, you've, you've held that paperback in your hand. You've, you know, you've, you've got it out there. It's self-published. What is your, what is your overall feeling about the experience? Is it, is it positive? Blinding tear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. But do you, are you ready to do another one? Like being a parent probably in the sense yeah. that it's a roller coaster. You yeah. have moments of just sheer like, Oh, what am I doing? Yeah. And, and then like, yeah, I'm super proud of this. Yeah. But mostly there's a lot of poop. Yeah. Yeah. Do you find that um, you're really excited for complete strangers to read it? But then if yes. you learn that somebody, you know, hey, I picked up your book. It's like, oh, my God, do I want them to read that? <laughs> you know? I do. Yes, I actually. Yeah. yeah, because it's like there's stuff in there that it, like you have to disconnect yourself from the characters. Yeah. Sometimes it's like the character will say something that you would never say or do something that you would never do. And it's like. Obviously, I'm doing this for the story and yep. to like reveal something about the character. But it's like, oh, geez, this is a terrible human. Yeah. I mean, we all put ourselves a little bit, a little bit of ourselves in every character we create. However, yeah, uh, it, just because uh, you, you write a character who does some fantastically evil, vile, vicious things. That doesn't mean that that's what you think or that's what you're going to do. And or uh, no matter how how tame it might be within the context of the book, you never want to want to think that your grandma might, you know, right. Have to come stumble across. I love seeing you. Right. Or right. Something. Yeah. I, I remember writing uh, a, a little short thing about a, a serial killer that I, I've I don't I've never put out there, but I, I let my wife read it and she kind of read it and she looked at me. And she goes, how do you? how do you come up with this kind of stuff that you're kind of disturbing me a little? Is that, and I'm like, hon, this is not the way I think it's just, this is what I think a serial killer would think, you know, this is right. This, exactly. It's, it's imagination. This is how I would imagine uh, a serial killer would feel when they uh, stick somebody with a knife. Uh, mm-hmm. I wouldn't feel that way because I wouldn't stick somebody with a knife, but like, for example, it's, in one of the stories, there is a character who uses a particular racial epithet. Oh, boy. And just writing it was like, yeah. oh, this is really, yeah. I, don't, I don't like having to even write the word. And it's just, right. but it really just goes, yeah, that you understand the story right there when you're yeah. like, yep. Yeah, it's like sometimes the only way to get somebody to really understand the villain in a piece is for them to do stuff like that, that of course you would never do. And Oh my God, I, I can understand how that would be for hard the to sake do. of shock. Value. Right. Exactly. Yeah. But you do want to definitely impress upon the reader that, Oh yeah, this is who this is. Yeah. Yep. So you did the, you all, you did the paperback option as well, which is uh, mm-hmm. uh, a really nice service that, that Amazon does which size did you choose uh it is six by nine six by nine that's what i went with as well this is just writer geek stuff now this is stuff yeah. geek stuff. did well, you go with like, a glossy or a or a matte I cover i did not and i regret it really because i love my i, I find mat. that the matte um 
gets kind of like you you can see fingerprints on it and i don't like yeah it. yeah well you can well you can change that though you can go into amazon and just change it so that future ones will will be glossy yeah that's that's another nice thing about self-publishing, you know, because I don't care who you are. I don't care if you are Keith Cunningham or you're freaking Stephen King. There will be typos in your book. And oh, yeah, fact, definitely. I found one already. Yeah. there. You know, it, it's it, like it's one where it's just an actual word. So spell check didn't catch it. But it's right. like, wait, this sentence no longer makes sense. Yep. And, and you know, and then you're looking at something and you're like. I should have italicized this line and it would have yeah. formatted it a little nicer. And it's a yeah. little, th cause you're never fully going to let it go. You're always going to be exactly people like gave George Lucas so much stuff for like yep. not being able to let go, but I get it. No, I totally get it. You're always going to look and go, well, this and then this. Yeah, that's better. Yeah, it's like this is what I wanted to do back then, but uh, the technology wouldn't allow it. Now that I, I can do it, I want to do it. Get, let, just let me do it. Yeah. But, you know, with e even like, uh, you know, you could pick up a, a freaking Stephen King novel and you're reading it and realize, holy crap, they misspelled this word. The you know, it's it's going to happen. It's you can have 16 different people read that page and not notice it because of the way our brains work. They're expecting yeah, to we, see a certain word and that's the word that their brains then interpret. Because I was reading a study that nobody actually truly reads a whole word. Right. You skim a, a, like a line of letters and your brain assembles it. Yep. It's like the, it's like a cookie in a freaking internet in your internet browser. Mm -hmm. It's like the, you, you type in a website address and and instead of pulling up the most up to date website all the time, it'll it'll just to make it quicker, it pulls up the version that was there the last time you looked at it. And yeah, yeah, that's what your brain does. It's expecting to see a certain word. Have you ever on, seen like the words where they just scramble all the letters, yeah. but you still know exactly yeah. what they were? Yeah. You still read the sentence, it reads just fine. Yep. But with this as a self-publisher, now of course. You can go in and you can make that change. It's like, oh, I, I, I completely put in the wrong word here. I'm going to go in. I'm going to update my manuscript. And every new ebook that is sold will have the correct version. Now, of course, every paperback that you've already printed out to sell and every paperback that has been bought will still have that incorrect version. And that but just increases the value. No. That's right. <laughs> I've, got, I've got the version where he didn't put the apostrophe in can't <laughs> on page 63. Yay. But uh, yeah. So glossy, huh? You think you should have went with the glossy? I think so. I went, Mostly, I went with. I probably just have really sweaty hands, though. So I went with Matt, the, the matte finish on all mine. I did have uh, one of the books, um, our friend Harold, who did the cover for one of my books. Uh, I sent him a copy and he thought it would have looked better on glossy. But. I think with the actual cover that I have, like if you're just looking at it separate from handling it, it mm. looks better in matte. Yeah. But I think when it comes to actually reading glossy, it's better. So let's let's get into more geeky technical stuff. Um, what did you use to put the cover together? That it was actually as far as like the program or mm. yeah yeah. Well, the piece of a artwork was easy because i actually had a um public domain photo that i was allowed to use nice. so I, don't know, I was just looking at it and like well that's perfect for this why wouldn't i use that um as far as the technology i used the same program that i use as when i do my cartooning which is clip studio paint yeah so i just created a um canvas that was the six by nine size and dragged everything in and I already had all of my fonts and stuff ready to go. So I was able to just. Nice. I use a combination of uh, Canva and then a really old version of Adobe Photoshop. <laughs> hey, Photoshop works. Yeah. That's what yeah. I used for many, many years until they went to the subscription model. Yeah. Yeah, me too. So, okay. Um, what do you use as your, your writing tool? What, what software do you use? Microsoft Word. Really? Yeah. yeah. And it was nice because I was able to do all the actual like, paperback formatting in it, too. Yeah. 
which I didn't realize I would be able to do. Yeah, but Amazon's I, uh, had like a this is how you do this inside Microsoft Word. Yep, yep, yeah. I use Word for for my paperback formatting as well. I use a thing called uh, Scrivener for when I when I write, and it also formats. Uh, it does the converting for ebook to different to oh, the different nice. e- ebook. Uh, you know whether the Moby for your your kindle or your epub for for other places and pdf it's and it's really have to nice check that out yeah it's um i i ended up getting it uh for it was either a discount or for free because of the one year that i did nano rimo the mm-hmm. national writer novel writing in a month or whatever it's called and i actually uh did the 50,000 words in the month and they often give away prizes for people who can do that. And one of the prizes was the, the Scrivener software. So, yeah, that's 50,000 in a month. Jeez. <laughs> but then I've, I've done the, I've done 24 hour comic day, which is a yeah stressful experience. too. yeah, I haven't done 50,000 uh, in a month since then. And that's ultimately what became my my first published book. But. Uh, Scrivener is a nice piece of software because it's it's built for um, for writing and publishing, whether it's a novel or scripts. Mm-hmm. You know, it's 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 got a uh, one of the things I ended up finding very helpful when it came to that last story where I um, just basically created a description for each paragraph. I didn't have to do that within the book itself. There are these little like There's... note cards. That float sounds outside. a little bit like a program called Caltex. Probably there's a lot. They're all that, very that was more specifically for screenwriting. Yeah, I think Scrivener is. Uh, Does was Scrivener originally marketed. have like tools set in for formatting for like screenplay format? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it was originally marketed as a uh, tool for screenwriters, but a lot of uh, self-publishing novelists have have started using it as well, and so they've they've made updates probably to, because to, it to makes the that. kindle formatting so easy yep yeah we've gone deep into the weeds here <laughs> that's all right i think uh i think two or three of my listeners will find it <laughs> will find it interesting um so do you have are, are you ready to to do another book um oh you... yeah i always have like seven eight hundred projects on the back yeah, burner yep yep it's just finding the time right now i'm finishing up um a few comic short stories for uh, Strange Places, which is my my other big project. Yeah. Which is my comic anthology thing. Yeah. Now, how many of those have you put out so far? Um, five issues and then two issues of Strange Places Presents, which are like longer format stories. Yeah. So like one story in, in per issue instead of like four. And where can folks go to check those out? Heroes Con in June. Right. Nice, nice, nice. I'm going to eventually get a uh, good collection put together. Yeah. You going to go digital with any of that stuff and get it over on places like Comixology? Yeah. If you're in Europe, uh, you can check out some of the stories in a European anthology series called Apocryphus. Nice. If you can read Portuguese. Okay. Uh, I cannot. Maybe some of my listeners do. Yeah. Yes, but that's uh, that that is uh, published by my friend Miguel George. Yeah. So the the arrangement that we would put together is, I'd write, he'd he'd draw, and we'd uh, he'd publish it in his thing, and then I'd publish it. In my thing is kind of nice. Yeah, that's cool. That's a nice collaboration. Yeah, it's it's weird because I've been working with Miguel on different things kind of for. 13 years? And <laughs> say the last name again. Miguel George. Uh, it, oh, yeah. It's spelled how you would spell Jorge. But. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know who that is. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. So, all right, let's 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 uh, back to the book. Let's think about next level. Are you thinking of audiobook? I hadn't. Um, hmm. You know, Amazon has... Uh, well, I don't know if they still do it. I know they have their uh, their ACX, I think is what it's called, where you can, you know, upload your own your own audiobook. But through that, they may still do it. Um, 
they had a program where you could hook up with uh, audiobook narrators and basically you you can work out various deals with them and in some cases you know you just you pay them up front and they record it in some cases if uh you know there there's a, a like a a royalty split where if they mm. you know they like the book they believe in it enough they will they will record it and then you get a certain percentage of the royalties and they get a certain percentage of the royalties and um, then of course there's the there's just the old fashioned do it yourself. It does appeal to my vanity. It's been a while since I've had any acting credits. Yeah. 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 I've uh, I've thought about it. Somewhere some there's a link to my IMDb page. <laughs> it's it's so long since your, I've done film stuff. I think it's on your website. Probably. Yeah. Um, yep, another right fun thing about the idea of doing like the audiobook is I can uh, play with some of the sound editing and. Yep. Make it more of an immersive experience, which, again, is not something I've had a chance to do really since college. Yeah. So, playing, I, with sound I, is, I do, playing with sound is fun. It, it, it really is. Um, yeah, I haven't done any film-related stuff since then, and it's – want to scratch that itch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-oh, he's going off on a new direction. I know. See, <laughs> I can't – I have a real hard time sitting still. Yeah. No, I get that. I, uh, you know what? I am the same way. It's just that uh, I'm also rather lazy. So <laughs> it's like, you know, I got this twitch and it's like, I want to be creative. I want to be creative, but I don't want to really do anything right now. My, mine is mostly like, but I also have to work and pay my bills. Right. Yeah. Real <laughs> life, real life just run it kind of kicks you in the butt every now and then. And it's and like, yeah, I'm also saving up money to buy a house. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. All right. Um, trying to think if there's any more questions I have in regard to your book and then self publishing in general. Cause uh, it's been a while since I've done it. And every once in a while. When are I, you going to next race something? I don't know. I, like I said, I, I, every once in a while, I open up my yeah, my, my, the my script here. My, yeah, now it's my podcast. I am gotcha. the captain now. <laughs> every once in a while, I open up my Scrivener and I look at various things that I've started and try to decide because I do. I want to put out something else. I it is. It's a. It's a. It can be a long and grueling, uh, very emotional process. But mm. when it's over, that's. It, there, you know, on the one hand, it's like it's uh, I've got this, it's done, it's complete, boom, it's out but there. You're you also feel so a little good. depressed because you're like, what now? <laughs> yeah, what's yeah, yeah. It's like there's nothing. <laughs> what am I supposed to do tomorrow morning, right? And then of I, course I, you're. It's probably like a like a bit like empty nester syndrome. Yeah, and then of course you you put it out there, and then ten minutes later you're looking at the you're on the the dashboard looking on the at the reports stats. say how many Why people bought how many. Yeah. <laughs> Why isn't this selling hundreds of thousands of copies already? Yeah. What am I doing wrong? I need to make <laughs> exactly. more people aware. Yeah. I give up. I'm never doing this again. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I've, I, I think about it all the time, but I'm kind of in the same boat where I have, uh, you know, a lot of stuff going on in my personal life as far as family and kids and work. And, but then at the same time, I've also, um, I'm you doing, could just become like a deadbeat. I could, I could. <laughs> I don't think I have the I don't I don't think emotionally I can handle that. I think I think I think I would actually let the guilt get to me. See, the but, key is just become cold and dead inside like me. Yeah, I'm working on that. I've been taking pills, but yeah. they haven't they haven't kicked in yet. The, <laughs> They're the called robot depressants. pills. They're just depressants. <laughs> yeah, depressants. Of antidepressants. Yeah. Cold heart pills. But uh yeah. Uh right, you know, it's like I the podcasting almost at this point is kind of scratching that creative itch. Mm-hmm. To a certain extent, uh, but yeah, I do. I, I I look longingly at the the nine or ten different things that I have started uh, over the years, and I want to publish each and every one of them. But I'm just, uh, it, it's like there's a reason Isn't why that I stopped. The worst that w- you want to be creative and then feel guilty yes. when you don't, and then yes. you look at other people who who just can seem to like go around and yeah. live their lives, and you just like, why can't I have that? Yeah. What? Why can't? Why? What? Why am I not forced to stay up in the middle of the night just feeling guilty because it's like, no, I'm going to get a full night's sleep tonight instead of I really yeah. should have finished this thing. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And then then there's all those folks out there that are being creative and writing and publishing and putting out comics or or, or, or books or, or whatever. And yeah, 
just, you just hate them, hate each and every one of them. And they hate themselves just as <laughs> That's much. That's true. Sure. That's true. It's it's like it's the grass is always greener thing, but it's a different different set of. I'm sure they're feeling the same thing. Yeah. Creative people, not not trying to claim that I am, but are de- we're definitely a uh, a a broken set of toys. Yeah, very true. Very much true. Yeah. All right. Um, what else you got going on? What is is there? Uh, what's on the what's what's in the fire for Keith Cunningham? What irons do you got? You got stale popcorn. That's stale popcorn. That's going for a while. Is there is there a an end date to that or a break or is it you just? I am looking at maybe doing it in, in like seasons. Yeah. Um. I think so that helps. Maybe around fall, I might take like a a season break for a couple months. Yeah, I think with something like that, you almost kind of have to, because then instead of sitting down each time you're getting ready to to create a new strip from scratch, you're not thinking to yourself, all right, here's the next one in the ever expanding line of strips I have to do forever with no end in sight. Where well, instead- I Fortunately, I like to work with a buffer on that. So yeah, I'm usually that- about 30 strips I have. Oh. That is good. That's really good. Yeah. I built up a lot before I actually launched. Yeah, that's always a good idea. I'm usually too impatient to do stuff like that. You know, I uh, I with this podcast, I've kind of designed it. I I do seasons. Uh, In fact, uh, at the end of May will be the end of the current season I'm on. And then I'm taking a month off. And uh, I am going to try during that month to still record and get episodes in the can. but yeah. it's always well, the helpful. Thing with stale popcorn. Um, I was, I had, I was ready to relaunch, and then like COVID hit, and yeah. movie theaters weren't open, right? For, like the better part of a year, and it felt very disingenuous to like yep. try to tell that story at the time. So I was like, eh, kick this can down the road a little bit, yeah. and I was able to like build up an even bigger buffer. And, yeah. Now, how often? How many? Because the, they're are they more than once a week? Uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays. Tuesdays and Thursdays. Okay. I'll have the the link in the show notes for that as well. Um, and again, that's at this point, you're writing it and you're drawing it. You're you're doing mm-hmm. it all yourself. You're the one man band there. Mm-hmm. How are um, how do you find uh, collaborating with others versus working on your own? Um, it it's a very interesting experience. Like the stuff like. I love when you're working with another artist and they think of something that you never would have thought of and then yep. you put it in there like, that's so clever. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just like, I, I love those little surprises. Yeah. I think if you're working, if you, if you have the right collaborator, um, it can be a wonderful thing. But at the same time, I also really like when I have a clear idea of something yeah. being able to go, well, I'm just going to go and do this. Yep. Yeah. So it's a very they're very different experiences, but they're both rewarding. Yep. Yeah. There's something to be said about, um, I guess, not having to depend on anybody to uh, put, you know, to have. It's something. generally generally cheaper. Yes. Yep. Yeah. When I, uh, I I spent a lot of my youth in various bands and uh, it's like you have to depend on two or three other guys to uh, to get the vehicle moving. And while. If if everything's running correctly, it's a it's, it's a great magic. thing. Yeah, but when it's not, it's like I could just let me do it. You know, <laughs> it's like if I could play all these instruments, I would do it. But mm-hmm. so there's there's it's there's, much easier to just keep track of yourself than yeah yeah exactly. All right, um, I'm, gonna, I'm 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 going through my my mental filing cabinet here. Uh, let's uh let's go a little a little off topic here. What all right. What currently out there, be it uh, television, comics, novels, whatever, what what are you currently enjoying? What are you currently ingesting and enjoying uh, on a weekly uh, basis? I'm loving, loving, loving Star Trek Strange New Worlds. Yeah, I need to get into that. It is per- perfect Star Trek, I think. Now, I'm told because I just started Discovery. Okay. I think I finished season one. I don't know. I can't now. I can't remember how far. Don't shouldn't you get to a certain point in discovery before you start watching Strange New? I don't think it's necessary to watch season two of Discovery, but I think it'll give you a little more 
appreciation. All right. Because they it, they did definitely launch it with the 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 actors from season two playing Pike and Spock, and I there are things that are loosely referenced. Well, then I might as well just keep going with Discovery then at this point. Yeah, on season two, I think for Discovery was the, like the high point of the show yeah. too. So okay, all right. What else? What uh, anything else on the the streaming services that? Um. Well. Um. Everything's kind of like the off season right now. Um, Looking forward to Obi Wan Kenobi. Oh yeah, that's coming up real quick. That's Friday, I think. I think so. That's gonna be. Oh, that's the same day Stranger Things season four hits. So yeah. give me. I'll, I'll I'll just fall into a TV hole that weekend. <laughs> yeah, I'm uh I'm really looking forward to it. I've I've enjoyed. Um, all the the Disney Plus Star Wars stuff that's come out so far. Yeah. So, and big fan of the Ewan McGregor Obi Wan Kenobi. So, mm. what about what about Moon Knight? Did you did you watch Moon Knight? What did you think about? Yeah, that? I enjoyed that. I did too. I I don't know much about Moon Knight, and I didn't know much going in except the basic premise of the split personality Egyptian. Yep. yep. But beyond that, not really a lot. Yeah, that's about a, as much as I knew as well. Yeah, which was kind of refreshing because so many other of the Marvel characters I had such a knowledge of that it was yeah. like I know Come what on. they're doing here. Yeah, yeah. Have you watched the uh, the trailer for She Hulk? Yes, that looks pretty good. I'm looking forward to it. Obviously, the uh, uh, I saw a lot of people complaining about the CGI. I was I was, one. I was Obviously, one. it's not done yet. See, see, I was I was one of those people. I'm like, I'm not I'm not too thrilled about the CGI. But the moment somebody pointed that out to me, I was like, oh yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> and I stopped complaining about it. They're gonna be working on it up until like the week before. It just there there there's a part of me that it just seems silly. I get that they want to get a preview out there, but. Right. I, you know, it's almost like Marvel doesn't need to advertise at this point. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But the the whole, you know, everything or they about, maybe could have hinted at her more yeah. than shown her yeah. directly exactly. wait until they had more of it finished. Yeah. So I I get it. There's such a whole mechanism anymore in place around a lot of stuff like that. It's sadly, we've actually gotten to a point where now we're getting teasers for teaser trailers. You know, it's like, here, here's the teaser for the teaser trailer. And now here's the teaser trailer, which really is a teaser trailer for, which is a teaser for the actual trailer. And it's like, just, I, I get it. Cause, cause I'm, I'm one of those idiots that's standing in line, you know, shoveling everything they give me into my mouth. But Mm. then at the same time it's like if uh, i am a definite consumer that's for yeah. sure but i, I think I, you know how alan feels about the trailers right who alan white um no i'm sure i do but it's he it's doesn't want to see mind. any any oh that's right in. yeah he's funny he's one of my favorite people it is hard to be around him and and just not be in a good mood yeah. One of these days I'm, I'm hoping I've never met him in real life. And actually, I you know what? I don't know why I, I'm going to say this right now. He's going to listen to this episode and and he, he, he's probably going to be like, uh, yeah, you know, I, I don't know why I haven't had him on the show yet. I need to do that because I, I think he and I would have a good time just talking about nothing in, in general, just all kinds of crap. Yeah. Alan, yeah. I'll reach out to you, buddy. <laughs> uh, season six, though, we're coming to a close, so we we may wait till uh, July before we do anything. Because uh, yeah, he he he's he's a great guy. Um, all right. Uh, what about comics? Are you do you still reading comics regularly? I don't read them in floppies anymore. I just yeah. do collections okay. when they come out. So I'm a perpetually six months to a year behind on what's going yeah. on. Why well, I, I read I read them on the apps, so I'm yeah. pretty much the same way. I'm loving everything they've done with uh, IDW's TMNT series. <laughs> so good. All right, I, I have to I, I I have to tell you, um, one of the other podcasts I do is called My Other Podcast, and it, it's uh, I, I have to give a little bit of uh, uh, information before I tell you my story. But this is a, a podcast I I used to only do for my patrons. And uh, just recently I've started, you know, they, they get the episode on a Friday and then it goes public the next Friday. And mm. so this Friday, an episode went up in which um, I've had I had a 
uh, nerdcore rapper Sulfur. Do you know him? Okay. I'm not familiar. He he's been on a few Adam Warrock songs. Um, okay. He do you like the Wheel of Time? The the series of the books. books. Yeah. I have not actually read it. Uh, he did a really awesome uh, album recently called The Wheel of Rhyme. It's it's ah. it's it's great. Uh, anyway, he. Uh, he and I got together to do an episode for my other podcast in which we counted down our top 10 favorite Michael kill songs. And, um, at the end, cause he's been on my show a couple of times. I said, we need to bring you back. And, and it, the, the turtles came up the IDW turtles run and he loves the turtles. And he said, IDW's run is the best run of the turtles ever. It and really, uh, they, it is like, it's taking so much from it, like every version yeah. of the turtles throughout and it's culminating it into something that touches on the fun, but also the seriousness of like the original run. It's just. Yeah. Perfect. Well, I'm reading, I'm reading the first collection right now. I think I just started issue three and, uh, and then him and I will, will get together later on down the line and talk about that first collection. So yeah, I'll get there, but, uh, that's funny you bring that up because I was just talking to him two days ago and the turtles came up. Um, there is somewhere online, there's a list of reading order that includes all the mini series. Yeah. To, to when to read that them in between the other collections. Okay. Cause they, I know they've, they've had a bunch of mini series. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Um, I guess I think I, I think I just started issue three this morning. Um, and I used to read the turtles back in the day, like back in the old black and white days when they were with Mirage and I read more, you know, because the original series, of course, eat back then just as much as it is now, uh, were really hard to get new issues because they were very independent, but as they started to blow up a bit self-published that's, they certainly were, were. Hey, <laughs> tying it back around. Um, they, they did another series at one point when they started getting more popular called tales of the, the TMNT, mm-hmm. which was more of an anthology and had different creators on it. And uh, that's the one I was really into. But as I'm reading these three issues, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm really finding it interesting the way that they are, kind of tying in the origin and bringing Casey Jones into it and uh, General Krang. Uh, it's it's so far. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. And I'm 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 looking forward to to moving forward on it. Yeah, they have as they go forward, they are basically pulling nothing's off the table. Yeah. So you were you a big fan of the cartoon? I think you're about that age. Is that I was prime age for. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm a, I'm a little older than you. So, I think by the time the cartoon came around, I was just like, nah, cuz you know, I was a big fan of the movies, as cheesy as yeah, they were. Um, Loved the movies, but there, the, there was the something... first one was I think it still holds up. Oh yeah. I agree. And I, I was Sulfur and I had the exact same conversation, uh, but the the second the, the third one, which apparently is the one that is despised by most, I actually like it better than the second one. I, I'm a big fan of the third one. I remember really liking it. I would have to see it again. It's, it's been so long. But in concept, it's not terrible that they they, got, they wind up in, you know, feudal Japan. Yeah. The ninjas works. It brings in the idea of the, uh, the time scepter, which was a thing from the comics. Yeah. I just, I, it's been forever since I've watched it, but I did see it in the theaters. And I remember walking out of the theater going, that was really good. That was very refreshing. I think very refreshing. if they cut all the the shenanigans with the samurai that were dumped into modern day, it probably yeah. would have been better. Yeah, that's true. But yeah, I just, you know, the thing about, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to turn into one of those, one of those old school fans there for a second. It's like when the, when the cartoon came out, you know, it was all about pizza and, 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 you know, the movies were the same way, but. I, I think I had, I'm I had a hard anti pizza agenda here. That's that's exactly what it is. There's too many too many carbs. That's that's what it comes down to. But it's it's like uh, for me, I completely understand it, though, because had I been at that age, had I been your age? Oh, my God, I, I would have totally been into that cartoon. It's like the people my age who were totally into G.I. Joe and Transformers mm-hmm. 
which hold up much better than the Turtles cartoon. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe. <laughs> I've seen some clips recently, and I'm like, wow, this was not so great. Yeah. But man, they, they made some great action figures. Yeah, the action figures were cool. All right. Well, um, the book, it's called Secret Highways and Other Stories. I keep, I, I have to keep looking at it. I hope that doesn't offend you, but for some reason. I'm deeply, deeply hurt. Well, because be, I keep thinking of, because your, your comic, uh, Strange, I know, I know it's Strange something, right? Strange Places. Strange Places. Because of Stranger Things and because of the, the Star Trek show, the, the Stranger Thing is just in my head all the time now. And so oh, that really reminds me of a funny story. So I came up with the title Strange Places before Stranger yeah. Things came out. Right. And some like kid. And when I say kid, I mean like an 11 year old got all up in my case at a con oh, once. Oh, it's like, are, so are you just trying to like copy their name? And I'm like, uh, no, it's just, you know, it's a different title. And then this is like, yeah, well, you shouldn't try to copy the name of our show. And I'm like, our show. <laughs> was it so was like, it oh, one of the kids? Was it? <laughs> no. It was just some random kid. Jeez. Uh, yeah. That's a, that's a toxic fanboy in the making right there. I hey, stay away from Star Wars. Bless them for loyalty, I guess. Yeah. But, but yeah, no, so <laughs> I think, you know, I know Secret Highways, but I'm thinking of Strange Places. And so I so always. So it becomes Strange Highways? Yeah. I, I don't want to accidentally say Strange Highways. So I, I got to keep. I got to look at it. That's okay. I keep trying to slip up and say stale highways. <laughs> That's that sounds really boring, doesn't it? <laughs> Here's my new book, Stale Highways, where nothing really happens. People just drive from place to place and yeah. It's it's the Seinfeld of of a Twilight Zone short stories. <laughs> <laughs> the episode where nothing ha- the twist is nothing happens. Nothing happens. So right now it's at, it's at Amazon, um, $6 for the Kindle, 16 for paperback. Not bad. Good pricing. Do you do, uh, do have you started using draft to digital? The what and the what now now? All right. Uh, when you get a chance, Google draft to digital, it's the number two. Uh, oh. they're another, basically if, uh, if you want to get your book out in a lot of other places, Draft to Digital is your second stop. So you got okay. Amazon, that's the major place. You go to Draft to Digital, it's going to send it out to to a lot of other places. It's also going to put it on Hoopla Digital for libraries, um, which uh, the only sales I get nowadays, and it's not much every month, but it's from people checking out the books through Hoopla Digital through their library. So Ooh. that's you know that. That's an option. It will there. There's the draft to digital is basically they do a number of of really awesome things for self publishers. And one of them is you 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 upload your your book and then yeah you choose all these different other uh, retail places to put it. Um, that so, is interesting. Yeah, anything other than an it. Amazon. Uh, matter of right. fact, I think you it, can even because Walmart now because Walmart is, is so goes wanting, through Amazon. Yeah, they're well. They're wanting. They're they're competing. They're trying to compete with Amazon now on on the on the internet space. And so technically, they have their own ebook area, and you can get them into the to the Walmart. Have you there looked as well, much so. at the um, Amazon Vellum service? Remind me what it is, because they had a bunch of that different seems, ones. It's it's basically the the subsection of the Kindle Direct. For like serialized stories. Yes, I have looked into that. It's interesting because it's another another kind of storytelling that that would be a great like pantser way to yeah. write. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Some of the some of the uh, the self publishing folks that I followed near the beginning of when I started out. That's how uh, before Vellum became a thing. Uh, that's how they got their recognition. They would go out there and they would uh, serialize all their stories before they started doing full mm-hmm. novels. And, you know, they. Um, the old was, uh, the old version of it back in the day would have been like the zines. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I, and, and in fact, uh, yeah, it's really interesting because I did check into it and I was going to do uh, I was going to serialize something at one point, but 
knowing the way my creative output works, where I could have three months where I'm just banging stuff out and then suddenly have six months where it's just nothing, just not feeling creative at all. Mm. Something like that's only going to work for me if I already have it completed, you know, and then start releasing yeah. it serialized. And you don't want to do it in a way that where you're just creating the extra stress for yourself. Exactly. When uh, in, in terms of self-publishing, because you're not going to pay for it like that. Yep. yep. I can, yep. I, I'll work with a deadline if there's, you know, monetary gain to be had yep. there. But I, I often find cause stress. <laughs> yeah, I often find deadlines do work for me, but only up to a certain point, <laughs> you know. Mm. So, yeah, I think I think the serialized it does teach discipline. It does. I just don't have any. And I'm an old dog, so I can't be taught new tricks. That's that's the rule. It's in the books. But uh, I think I, it's a very interesting on, uh, cross stretch. Yes. People have <laughs> put it on pillows and stuff. I think it's a very interesting model. And uh, um, would love to do it. And I think I think it's really I think it's a really good idea. Unfortunately, a lot of people take like their full novel and they just release it one chapter at a time like that. And it's like that's which is that's not, not really, really. Yeah, that's not serialized. It's it it's, it's, needs to be episodic. You know, it almost needs to yeah. be a full story each in each chapter. Yeah. Or to, all intentionally designed. A, right. We're going to, we are going to like movie serial this where we have the cliffhanger. And then, yep. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, and it's, it's the kind of stories that we grew up with reading old Marvel and DC comics. You know, mm -hmm. it's uh, every issue ends with a, with a cliffhanger uh, that is quickly resolved in the next issue and then off to the next uh, story, basically, is, yep. is how a lot of that works. So, yeah. All right. Well, um, Keith, uh, I want to thank you for coming on. Um, this is, we've talked many times through email, but I think this is the first time we've done a, uh, I think face. back in the day, um, ultra friends go, maybe I'm old. My memory doesn't work very well. <laughs> I really, I, yeah, I'm sure we did ultra friends go. Oh, yeah, man. I remember that a little way back. That's old school stuff. That was, that was my first round of just another fanboy, Wasn't it? That was way back in 2006, seven, eight, somewhere around there. I'm not even sure. You'd have to ask Harold. He might. Yeah. Good Lord. You're bringing His up kids memories. Are actually kids and uh, instead of full grown yeah. adults. And... I was going to say y'all were babies, but Harold's actually Harold's the exact same age as me. He just he's he was born in March. I'm, I was born in July. So he's a little bit older. So he's I like to call him old man. But... <laughs> so if you know how old Harold is and you know how old I'm about to be in in July. 15. We're going to put him on blast for his age. <laughs> What? We're just gonna put it all over the internet. Yep. We're like Harold's all. Look at this. That's the whole, that the theme of this episode. Really, we were just all of that was to get to this point. Yes. My Harold whole life Jeanette is, is old. To get to this point. <laughs> He's older than all of us. Yay! <laughs> Makes us feel better about ourselves. Just like all pushing right. over a toddler because it's easy. <laughs> Makes you feel just a little bit of power for just a little bit of time. That's right. <laughs> so, all right. So this will go up on Tuesday, right? Yeah, Tuesday 24th. So this will be my Tuesday episode. So you can look for it then. I haven't quite come up with a title yet. Um, pushing right now, over I'm, I'm pushing good. over a kid with Keith Cunningham. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking you're just going with a straightforward self-publishing with Keith Cunningham. That works. I haven't, or... Uh, or traveling a secret highway, something like that. I don't know. But uh, I'll have to come up with some kind of – I'm looking at your book again. I may I may use uh, your cover for some artwork. I always do a little oh, little thing with some artwork for the title page. Title page. Doesn't to me sound all important. <laughs> but For the fans. Yeah. For the fans. Yep. All right, dude. Uh, it was all good right. talking to you. Um, yep. Go enjoy the rest of your Sunday, uh, doing whatever it is you do in in the in the in, in the Sundays of your life. Often What's your perfect Sunday? Happy. Was that from Hot Fuzz? <laughs> Describe your perfect Sunday. I think that was from Hot Fuzz. Yeah, those are some good movies. Have you seen Last Night in Soho? I have not. Not yet. No. It's good. Very good. Yeah, I have. It's not funny. But <laughs> no, I also haven't seen. Is it Baby Driver? Is that the other movie he did? 
Yeah. Recent. Yeah. I haven't seen that one yet either. Not sure why. It's like if, if Simon Pegg and Nick Frost aren't in it, what's the point? Even though Scott Pilgrim versus the world was, is one of my favorites. That's a, that's a great movie. No vegan diet, no vegan powers. Once you were a vegan, now you will be gone. Yeah. All right, dude. I'll let you go. Um, All right. I'm sure my dog needs me. I've been ignoring him. He's not. He's asleep. <laughs> what a life. Yeah. Sleep all day. Oh, Great. That's that, that's what I would go for if I could. Yeah. No, but you got stuff to create. <sighs> yep. You got you to gotta work on that next book in, in, in starring a uh, – your main character will be a cartoonist who um, does a podcast – about cartooning that's as far as i go see that's that's my that's where my creativity is right now i was trying to think you of some point people in the direction and let, let them go sold your soul to the devil to uh create the ultimate cartoon create the ultimate web comic no that's not good that's not good at all it's too close to real life you have a crossroads demon in one of your stories are you a supernatural fan i know that's not where uh, crossroads I've never demons seen it. come from okay they're one of their one of their big elements is, is crossroad demons yeah all right well i'm not going to push you towards supernatural i mean it's only 15 seasons worth of stuff yeah yeah that's to. too much commitment for <laughs> it's a it's a lot of stuff it's worth it's like it a prequel coming out too yes there is yes there is yes there is plus the plus the, the two guys are just really good looking you know make me feel bad about myself well that's okay it's okay to, to acknowledge that there are better looking people out there no no i have to be the best Okay. <laughs> All right. As long as you have goals. That's right. All right. All right uh, I'll talk to you later, man. Thanks for coming on. Have a good one. Bye. There you go, folks. That was a long talk. We covered many topics. Uh, we delved into self-publishing quite a bit because I do find it rather interesting. I find it an interesting subject since, you know, I've done it. I I want to do it again. Um, I just have to finish writing the 20 or so stories that I've started. Um, yeah, but that's the episode. So, of course, as I always say, if you want to provide me with any feedback. I have an email address. I have a phone number that you can call and leave a voicemail, or you can use the phone number to send me a text. I honestly don't have any of that information in front of me. Well, the email address, just another fanboy at gmail.com. I've, I've, I've rather memorized that one, but the phone number I don't have memorized yet, and I don't have it in front of me, but it's in the show notes. So please feel free to do that. Also feel free to rate and review us over on your podcasting app of choice, providing they allow you to do that. And of course, you know, just spread the word, Thunderbird, tell everybody about the show. It's much appreciated. You can also join us over at the Patreon, patreon.com slash Stephen R. Orr. And for as little as a dollar a month, um, you're going to get stuff like my other podcast a week before everybody else. I try to get these episodes out to my patrons earlier than what you regular folks you know, when you regular folks, uh, I'm going to bear down on the regular folks thing because I've said it twice now and uh, uh, I'm going to say it again. When you regular folks get this, I try to make it available earlier to the patrons. I've been failing quite often there. And uh, hopefully the month that I take off in June, I'll be able to use some of that time to get ahead of the game because I would like to, whenever possible, record and release everything on the patron, the patron, the Patreon a week before it goes out to you regular folks. <laughs> I don't mean that as a slight regular folks, because uh, I'm just as regular as everybody else. But you get that for a dollar a month, and plus you're you're helping me to uh, pay all my podcasting bills and whatnot. Other than that, folks, I really don't have anything else to say to, to wrap this up. I know that we're going to get a JAF classic episode on Thursday. I have no idea what it's about because I haven't listened to it. Uh, since it was released back in, I think we're in January of 2007 at this point. And then next week, you will get episode number 266, the the episode that goes out before I go on vacation. And then uh, just wait to see what you get in June. Be nice to each other. Bye.
Bye, Daddy. Bye, bye, Daddy. Good job. Yeah.